It was a hectic scene in front of Brian and Nicole Albert's home in Canton, Massachusetts on the morning of January 29th. Police, firefighters, and paramedics all responding because Boston police officer John O'Keefe was found unresponsive on the ground in the snow. Officer O'Keefe had spent the prior evening bar hopping downtown. The Alberts were hosting an after party and had invited John and his girlfriend, Karen Reed. Karen never went inside. She says she dropped John off and went back to his house, then woke up early and began frantically looking for him. Prosecutors say Karen is the one who killed John. They say she ran him over with the back of her car on purpose because their relationship had soured and she was filled with jealous rage. Karen says that's not true and believes it was actually the people inside the house who ambushed John and then framed her for his murder. Tonight we have the latest from court as Brian and Nicole Albert take the stand. We'll take you inside the home and break down both theories of this murder as we continue our our investigation into the tragic death of Officer John O'Keefe. Hi, I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. What a big Friday. What a big Friday in Dedham, Massachusetts in the case against Karen Reed. A lot to get through tonight. Sit down, get ready. We're going to walk you through it. We're going to take you um, into the house, take a look at all the theories here tonight. Uh, but let's start here with the death scene, which is the Alberts' home. However you want to define that, whether it is the front lawn, which is part of the home, or perhaps inside. Depends upon your, your perspective. But the bottom line is, this was the scene of John O'Keefe's death. He, he was on that front lawn when he was found. He was left out in the cold for a long time, and he was killed. The question is, was he murdered? Was he accidentally killed? Um, did something else happen? I mean, this is, these are all the things you're trying to figure out here. And the jury has to figure out. They're the ones. But there are competing theories, and both of them are really murder theories. And um, the first one is that he's murdered outside on the lawn by Karen Reed with her car. The murder weapon is her Lexus SUV. And from looking at the evidence that we've seen so far inside of this courtroom, including videos of just before this alleged murder, something happened in that drive, that very short drive, according to the prosecution. Something happened in that drive from the Waterfall Bar and Grill. I was there. I made this drive uh, to the Alberts' home. It is quick. It is super quick. Now, I don't know if they knew exactly where they're going. Maybe they passed the house once, had to loop around a little bit. You know, it's a little cold, whatever. Um, but it's a quick drive. But something happened in that drive, if you believe the prosecution's theory. Some sort of fight. Something happened. And as a result, when John O'Keefe got out to go inside that home to the party, Karen Reed pulled her car up, stopped, threw it in reverse, and put her, her foot on the pedal, was looking at him in the backup camera, and ran him over on purpose. And then after she hit him, she left him there on the lawn to die in the cold and drove away. Okay? That is the prosecution theory here based upon what we've heard from the opening statement, based upon what they've said in pretrial motions, based upon the evidence that we've seen so far. So what's the other uh, theory here? Is that something happened inside the home, that he's ambushed, maybe down in that basement, because he's walking up and down the stairs, according to um, some information that they believe they've extracted from John O'Keefe's phone, that he's walking up and down stairs, which would put him down in the basement. So what happened down there? He was ambushed by who? Why? Again, you look at the video at the waterfall, and there's a lot of folks in, in that video who are at the house. Was it one of them, or was it someone else who was at the house? Was something said? Did something happen? That's what the defense is saying. And they're saying ambushed. Ambushed. Which, when you say ambushed, to me that means more than one person. You don't get ambushed by one person. Right? So, for whatever reason, people inside that house wanted to murder a Boston police officer? That's what the defense is saying. So, 
Today, huge day, because this home is the centerpiece of this entire case, and the homeowners testify today. One still has to come back on Monday for cross-examination, but yes, Brian and Nicole Albert, the owners of the home, uh, testified. And their testimony is the first time we're hearing from anyone who was inside the house that night. Significant, significant day, big testimony. Let's take a look at some of the biggest moments. Uh, rarely doesn't mean to you 67 phone conversations within a seven month period, does it? It's not a lot. I, w I wouldn't think it's a lot. You certainly mentioned my client's arrest with Courtney Proctor on the very day that she was arrested and you were talking to Courtney, correct? Correct. Did you tell Courtney <coughs> Proctor during any of these 67 phone calls that you were a witness in her brother's case? I don't remember. You had learned that Colin was at 34 Fairview on January 29th of 2022, correct? Yes, after midnight. And you now know that that is the same house outside which John O'Keefe was found dead the next that morning, correct? Yes, I do. Turning back to Mr. O'Keefe just for a second, if you recall, uh, what, if anything, do you recall him to, to be wearing as far as clothing was concerned during your interaction? I believe he had a hat on, uh, some sort of just sweatshirt, jeans, and sneakers. At any point in time that you saw him or while he was talking to you, did you see any sort of like winter jacket or big coat or anything like that? No. Specifically, John O'Keefe or Karen Reed that you saw at the bar earlier that night, at any point in time on the evening of the 28th or the early morning of the 29th, did either of those people come into your house? No, they never came into my home. I had missed the conversations about Jennifer reaching out with John or her texting him and him texting her about where we lived. I didn't even realize that that was happening, that they had any intention to come. At some point um, between 6 and 6.30 that morning, my sister Jennifer came bursting into my bedroom and she's saying, he's out in the snow, we found him out in the snow, we don't know if he's okay. And my immediate thought was just that something had happened to one of my children, something had happened to one of her children. I couldn't imagine why she was in my bedroom at this time in the morning. Did you know John O'Keefe? So I knew John O'Keefe, but not, not well. Um, I had only met him two times prior to that night. But I knew, I knew him to be a Boston cop, and I knew um, of him, and I knew some, some things about him. Through the course of your work over the decades that you worked with the Boston Police, did you ever work with or have any professional sort of interaction with John O'Keefe? No, I don't remember working with him directly within the Boston Police Department. I knew him to be a friend of um, my sister-in-law, Jen, and her husband, Matt. Um, I knew him to be a friend of my brother, Chris, and my sister-in-law, Julie. Um, I knew him to be a friend of my brother Kevin's. At any point in time during the evening, uh, did you know or did you become aware of either John O'Keefe or the defendant Karen Reed coming over to your house? No. <clears throat> and at no point in time over the course of, of that evening or the early morning there, did John O'Keefe or Karen Reed physically come into your house? John O'Keefe and Karen Reed never entered my house. Big day, huge witnesses, and Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson is there outside the courthouse in Dedham, Massachusetts tonight. Matt, great to see you. Um, you know, the Free Karen Reed movement, really founded by the local blogger, journalist, YouTuber, whatever you want to call him, uh, Turtle Boy. And today, a little drama involving Turtle Boy inside the courtroom. What can you tell us? Hey, Vinny, nice to see you. A lot of drama here 
and never a dull day in Dedham, right? So when we talk about Aiden Carney, he is the blogger known as Turtle Boy, and he was booted from key testimony, not only today, but in the future for a lot of key witnesses because the Commonwealth, they accuse him of witness intimidation. So he's not going to be allowed in the courtroom. He said that his attorney happened to be here at the courthouse on an unrelated matter, and that attorney argued this. He wishes to be in the galley of journalists like everyone else and cover the case. There's never been a problem whatsoever. This is more personalized retaliation from the Norfolk County DA's office against Mr. Carney. And there's absolutely no reason for the government to sneak behind my back to interfere with his First Amendment rights. It's outrageous, and on procedural grounds, I ask you to deny the motion. My role in this case, Commonwealth versus Karen Reed, is to assure that the defendant's constitutional right to a fair trial uh, are honored and upheld. And because of the chilling effect that Mr. Kearney's presence, I find, will have on the witness's testimony, I'm going to excuse him while the named witnesses in the Commonwealth's motion, um, Julie Nagel, Christopher Albert, Colin Albert, Michael Proctor, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, Brian Albert, and Yuri Bukinik. And the Commonwealth also today requested Nicole Albert because of the um, incidents that are reportedly have been held um, at her home. I'm going to excuse him during all of that testimony. That's a lot of names, Vinny, and a lot of witnesses we've yet to hear from here in Dedham. Now, after that happened, I noticed that he was on a bench, a park bench, at the end of the courthouse, watching online. He says he's going to appeal. And uh, in the meantime, his supporters, they're here at the courthouse each and every day. He was in line with a lot of the other media in the media line beginning at 4.30 yesterday to get one of those 10 seats in the courtroom. This case, as we've been saying from the beginning, unlike any other. Okay, let's get to the big, big testimony today. Let's begin with Nicole Albert. Um, what did you find as the key takeaways from her testimony today? Yeah, she went first of the two Alberts, the owners of 34 Fairview. And I have to tell you this much, the mood here at the courthouse, it changed. When both she and her husband walked up those steps and walked in, everyone was bracing for what she was about to say because, like you said, she was uh, the first witness on the stand that was actually in that house for that after party. Now, uh, she testified to this. She said that uh, Karen and John never entered the home selling the house and getting rid of the dog was just a coincidence and had nothing to do with John O'Keefe's death. Take a listen to this. You testified that your German shepherd, Chloe, was also at the house when you arrived home on January 29th, correct? Yes. Um, she's a large German shepherd. Yep, about 70 pounds. She's not great with strangers. I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that she... It's kind of a poorly worded question. Would you say that she's good with strangers? I'd say she's fine with strangers. Fine with strangers. Ms. Albert, Chloe has injured other humans, hasn't she? Objection. I'm going to allow that. In one incident in May of 22, when she got out and was fighting with another dog, the woman who was dog it was tried to break up the two dogs. And while she was trying to break up the two dogs, she got injured. Ms. Albert, you don't have Chloe anymore, do you? Nope. In May of 2022, four months after Mr. O'Keefe's death, you got rid of your family dog of six years. Objection. So is that true? Is that when you got rid of your dog? I did not get rid of my dog. I rehomed my dog. Your dog is no longer in the Canton area, correct? No, but I know where she is. She's in Vermont. 
And that dog, Vinny, said to be aggressive. The defense really pointed that out, that this dog has attacked at least one or two people. Trying to break up a fight, she was more aggressive towards other dogs, this German Shepherd mix. The other thing that stood out to me with this uh, particular witness, Nicole Albert's testimony, is the fact that she puts Colin Albert at her house at 1215 in the morning when she walks through the door. She says she sees him, but that's the exact time that his mom said that he was already at her house. That testimony yesterday significant um, both the dog and, and Colin Albert for the defense right because the defense is alleging the the um, the wounds on John O'Keefe's arms are from the German Shepherd we've been hearing that uh, in many pretrial hearings in this case and the timing of when Colin Albert leaves and gets home significant as well all right let's move to Brian Albert who is a fellow Boston police officer um, as John O'Keefe was, his testimony is significant as well. What, what are your takeaways there? He had major testimony today. He was only under direct, but he also testified to the fact that it, it was a coincidence selling the house, also rehoming the dog. And he testified to the fact that Karen and John never entered his house. He never saw them there. And then he said after everyone had left that night and he went to bed, he slept through the sirens. He didn't hear the police officers on his lawn. He didn't know anything was going on until Jen McCabe came in his house, in his bedroom, burst through the doors and screamed that someone was out there on the lawn. Um, here's part of his testimony there. Um, I didn't see that there was a reason to, to go out to that, to that area. The police had already been in my house. They had already talked to us about what was going on. Um, it was a snowstorm at that point. Um, they were trying to conduct an investigation, and I didn't want to interfere with it or have anything to do with it. So he, he's a Boston police officer, he knows CPR, and he hears of a situation happening on his lawn. That was his answer for not going outside during direct. Well, on Monday, he's going to be on cross. We met up with Alan Jackson as he was leaving the courthouse, and here's what he said. It's a pathetic excuse for, for why he didn't come outside when then there's a, there's a man dying on his lawn and there's six emergency vehicles and two SUVs and three women, one of whom is screaming her head off on a quiet street. Uh, it, it makes absolute no sense. I slept through it. They've got a 70-pound they've got a German Shepherd six feet from that window that would have been barking. Alan Jackson right there in the beginning of that statement said it was pathetic that he didn't go outside. So you know that cross is going to be contentious. Get your popcorn, Vinny. Absolutely. I mean, this, this, is, this is, Monday's really the beginning of the defense case. It's the beginning of the defense case, the cross-examination of the, of the people who were inside the home, but it starts with really Brian Albert. Um, Matt Johnson, you need to rest up this weekend. So do that. Monday night, we'll see you again. I'll try. Thanks so much. All right, Vinny. All right, folks, uh, when we come back, we've got a lot more to get to. We are going to take you inside that home. We're going to show you the floor plans. We'll show you some images from inside and then talk about where everyone is, what they could see, and we'll evaluate the two theories, the two theories, whether John O'Keefe was killed outside or inside. Plus, coming up next hour. <laughs> Tammy Daybell's cause of death is front and center in this case. We'll listen to the deputy coroner. What did she observe? We'll bring in our own experts to take a look. It was an unusual looking amount of foam to me. And I'm curious, what, you know, if there was something that could cause that in my mind, trying to think about reasons for this death. On the next episode of Accomplice to Murder. What he found was a dead man and no sign of the two sons. One of Florida's most notorious murders. They were now claiming that their confessions were fabricated, that in fact it was Ricky Chavez who committed the murder. His real interest was in molesting Alex. Did you at some point believe that you were in love with Ricky Chavez? Yes, sir. Accomplice to Murder with Fanny Politan. All new episode, Sunday night, 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. house was, was everybody else sort of situated. So everybody was in the kitchen and then we have a connecting 
dining room, but it's opened. It's only, you know, a difference of five feet. Um, and then we have the family room den that's adjacent to the, to the kitchen. But they're all within, they're all close proximity. That's the homeowner, one of the homeowners, Brian Albert, talking about the after party and where everyone was in the house. So what we're going to do, this segment, we're going to take a look at what is going on inside and the floor plans from the perspective of what could people see from inside the house if a murder was taking place outside of the house. Then in our next segment, we'll take a look at the defense theory. But here we're going to focus on the prosecution theory. So let's take a look um, at the floor plan and some images that we have for you. Let's put them up on the screen. Okay, so start with the floor plan and the circle. That is, that is the main front door because there's actually two front doors. But that's the main front door that goes into the foyer. To the left of it is the study. Um, the picture on the top left, the circle to the left, that's right where that front door is. And then you see, see the entrance to the study. The bottom picture, you can see where in the house the study is. That's the rectangular, a uh, long horizontal square, uh, rectangle. And then the longer uh, vertical rectangle, that is the main front door. So these are the two areas that are closest to the flagpole, closest to where John O'Keefe, according to the prosecution, was murdered. But what we heard from the testimony was nobody was in the study. Okay, so where, where are people? Well, people are described as being in the kitchen and the dining room. So let's take a look at that. Start with the floor plan. That's the dining room, which opens up to the kitchen, which is just behind it. You look to the uh, top left photo. That's from the kitchen looking into the dining room area. So it's one of those gatherings, right? People get together. They seem to uh, hover in the, in the kitchen, and, and it opens to the dining room where there's more seating. So what do we see uh, when we look at the front of the house? Those are two windows, okay? Two windows that are sort of in the middle of the home, not the closest to the flagpole, but could you see what was happening by the flagpole uh, from there? Would you see or hear a murder if you're in the dining room, okay? Let's get to one other room where people were described as being, which is the living room, which is a little further down, right? Um, you can see where it is on the floor plan. There's another uh, front door that takes you into the living room. So they have two front doors. Uh, you look in the living room, what do you have? You got the fireplace. Um, and then you can see where the door is there and, and potential windows. I don't know how much you're seeing there, perhaps a little bit towards the left, but you're, what you're really seeing is the, is the driveway. You know, and you're seeing the, the front of the house. So a lot of questions that I have. Again, we're focusing right now on the prosecution theory that the murder, murder took place on that front lawn with people in the house. Does it make sense? Should people have seen something, heard something? Let me bring in my guest. Joining me, Karen Reed, supporter and expert, Nick Rocco, defense attorney Joseph Krauske Jr., who at one time represented um, a nephew of the homeowners, um, Colin Albert, and the YouTuber behind the Yellow Cottage Tales, Kevin Lenahan, is with us. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Kevin, all right? Why, how could a murder take place in the front of that house and no one inside the house notices anything explain that to me you mean take place outside the yeah way the yeah we're, we're going with the yeah. I, 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 i'm trying to set the rules here we're going with the prosecution theory first that the murder took place outside close to the flagpole um and yet people are in the house we showed you where the windows are we showed you where everything is um why doesn't anyone inside the home notice a murder taking place well, the state's theory is that she backed up at 23 miles an hour for 60 feet, right? How long does that take? A few seconds, a couple of seconds. So if you didn't happen to be looking out the window and, you know, would you have heard something? Well, it's the winter. You got the storm windows up. It's windy outside. It's snowy. Um, so I think it would have been just kind of random luck if someone happened to look outside and see what happened. Joseph, uh, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Not having an eyewitness or an ear witness uh, to this uh, alleged murder that prosecutors are saying happened. Well, uh, good evening. Not many murders do have eyewitnesses, right? A lot of them that do don't end up at trial. Uh, you got to look at the geographical positioning of the house on the lot and where the uh, locus of the actual accident was. It was to the front, 
to the left. Uh, so it doesn't look like there's a good vantage point. Not only do you have the conditions outside, but you have the conditions inside, right? This is an after party. I would imagine people were loud and boisterous. People were coming and going, and we heard testimony that Brian Albert Jr. had friends over. Uh, anyone knows anecdotally, you huddle in the kitchen, people are laughing, having a good time, talking. I don't know if you would necessarily hear a car striking a human being. It's at least more plausible than not hearing 12 or 12 people not hearing or seeing a human being get pummeled to death inside. We're going to get to that in the right. next segment. Yeah. We'll get to that in the next segment. Sure, I think That's why plausible. I try to set the parameters best I can, the best that I you can. Know, you do a great job of doing it. One thing, though, Matt Johnson, he, he did say something. I just have to correct him about, and Alan Jackson said it was, uh, I think, ludicrous or pathetic, his explanation. I think Brian Albert was pretty clear and concise uh, that the information he got at 6.30 in the morning uh, was that John O'Keefe had already been transported by uh, ambulance to the hospital. And, and look, he's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. He stays in because it's an investigation. It's not his investigation. There's no jurisdiction. It's on his property. Had he gone out, the same people complaining that he didn't go out would have said that he was meddling in an investigation that had nothing to do with them. So I just wanted to add that, augment uh, Matt Johnson's introductory segment there. Absolutely. All right, Nick, um, your thoughts uh, about... Um, the murder taking place on the front lawn. You've got people in the house apparently coming and going, and no one sees or hears anything. Well, um, you know what I think happened. So as far as people not looking out the window, we do know that Matt McCabe uh, was kind of hanging out by the window because uh, in one of his interviews, he stated that he saw V-shaped tire marks outside in the snow indicating that that would have been when Karen turned around. So if she had hit him, he was apparently looking out the window at the right time and, and would have seen something. But as far as everybody else, I mean, I just saw the layout of the of the house there. Um, there's a few windows on the bottom. Yeah, somebody, somebody would have had been looking outside um, at the exact moment or after the fact that she, quote, you know, supposedly hit him. But I do believe that if John was on the lawn outside while everyone was inside, um, when they were leaving the house to get in their vehicles alone, they would have seen a body on the lawn, and especially Jen McCabe because she was parked in the driveway. So when they backed out of the driveway and cut the wheel to the right, those headlights would have been exactly on that flagpole, and John, John would have been laying there. And that's before the wasn't. snow falls, right? That's before the, the six I mean, inches it was, fall. It was, it was lightly snowing at that point, but at, at that point, when she backed out of the driveway, those lights were on the flagpole. Okay, I want to um, take a listen now to Nicole Albert. She also testified, the other homeowner, um, talking about th the next morning, right? You know, what, what did they see? What did they hear as they're in their uh, bedroom? So on January 29th, you had two bedroom windows on the left side of the house that were facing the front lawn where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found, correct? Yes. You're aware that Ms. Reed, Jennifer McCabe, and Carrie Roberts arrived outside your property around 6.04 a.m., correct? Yes. Did you hear any fire trucks that morning? I did not. Did you hear any ambulances? I did not. You didn't see the flashing lights of emergency vehicles outside your bedroom window? I did not. My blinds were shut, my curtains were closed. I did not see anything. Okay, let's uh, put up on the screen now so everyone has an idea where the primary bedroom is, where they were sleeping. You look at the floor plan, it's all the way to the left. Um, there it is. Um, you look uh, to the photo there, you can see which way the, the bed is situated. You see where the windows are, and then you can see where the windows are on the outside of the house, the closest to the alleged murder scene. Right there is where that flagpole is. Um, let me ask you, Kevin, um, they don't know anything's going on in front of their house until the sister-in-law goes through the unlocked front door and then bursts into their bedroom. Uh, does that make sense to you? When you first listen to it, and when I first listened to it last a year ago, no. But when you process it through 100%, look, we had an incident in my family's house um, last September with a bad storm that went through and the power was out for a few days. 
On our street, there was a tree down right in front of the house. Later at night, about 9 o'clock, a fire truck came and sat in front of the, tr- in front of the uh, down tree right in front of our driveway for about 10 minutes. It had the lights on, but no flashing sirens. My dad was about the same exact distance as Brian Albert would, and he had was, fell asleep and took a nap and never even saw the fire truck come in. So I don't think it's unusual. It's a windy day. People are sleeping. And also, just to reaffirm what Joe said, the dash cam video shows that Jen McCabe went into the house that morning at 634 and the lights came on at 639. The only way that Brian Albert could have administered CPR to John O'Keefe is if he somehow caught up to that ambulance before it reached the hospital because that ambulance was gone. So Alan Jackson spreads more well, 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 nonsense we'll, we'll than see. Andy on That's Halloween. going to be the cross-examination <laughs> on Monday. That's something to look forward to. Um, let me ask you, Joseph, does it make sense to you um, that all this is happening right in front of the house? The primary bedroom is um, the closest to the crime scene. Flashing lights, lots of people, uh, people screaming. Um, what are your thoughts? Does it make sense that you're not woken up until your sister-in-law uh, opens an unlocked front door and then goes into and opens your bedroom? Sure. I think a lot of us have similar stories to Kevin's about police response, emergency response in neighborhoods uh, where you have discussions with your neighbors the next day and, and they didn't see anything or hear anything. You also have to remember uh, they had gotten home at, uh, they had went to bed at around 2.30 in the morning. They had been drinking all night and When I saw the cruiser cam footage, it didn't seem to me uh, that there were sirens on any of the emergency vehicles. I I could be mistaken, but I think what they say lines up with the video of Jen McCabe going in the house, the lights going on. Uh, The story is plausible, it's believable, it's consistent. Uh, So I certainly think that the position of the body where it was such, just straddling the property line between the two houses where there were no sirens, uh, I think it's certainly believable. Nick, I'll give you the final word on this. Does it make sense to you? Well, let's just say we believe her testimony and her blinds and curtains were shut. You know, she may not have heard sirens. She may not have seen lights. But there were two phone calls to her at 6.09 and 6.07, and they, they were both picked up. The Celebrite data shows that whether it was Voice Nicole mail. who answered the phone or... Uh, Brian, somebody answered the phone, and it's go- it's going to be proven in court. So regardless of what they saw outside, they knew early that morning that John was outside. All right, Kevin's saying it's a uh, voicemail. Again, that's something else that's going to develop uh, during the course of this case. All our guests are staying with us. When we come back, uh, we'll evaluate the scene now based upon the defense theory that John O'Keefe was ambushed inside that house. Scan now. Do you recall your husband and Brian Higgins left your view and went to some other place in the house that evening, correct? It could have. Ms. Albert, how many steps is it from the front door to the basement? Steps? Okay. We're going to take a look at this uh, situation from the defense perspective, the defense theory that John O'Keefe was ambushed in that house. Was he ambushed in the basement? Did John O'Keefe go in the basement? How many steps is it to the basement from the front door? Let's take a look. We've got the floor plan of the home. And you can see uh, in the picture to the left, the arrow goes from the front door uh, towards that table. Now that table backs up to the wall that is in front of the stairwell going down to the basement. You just go right around the corner there, just in front of the entrance to the kitchen is where the door is to the basement. Now let's take you down into the basement so you can see what's down there. Uh, There's a huge workout room that we saw on realtor.com. Not sure if that's what was going on there um, on that night, if that's how the setup was, but that's how it was set up on realtor.com. And then there's a little bonus room on the side that looks like it's nicely uh, uh, finished. Um, let's bring back in our guests, Nick Rocco, Joseph Krasky Jr., Kevin Lenahan. Uh, let me ask you, Nick, do you believe John O'Keefe went into the went down to the basement? Um, and, and do you believe he was ambushed inside that home? John O'Keefe 100% went in that basement. We know he went in the house because his Apple Health data shows three flights of stairs, okay? One other important fact is 
Brian Albert said today that he brought Brian Higgins upstairs to view pitchers. But in Brian, uh, sorry, Brian Albert stated that. In Brian Higgins' proffer with the feds, he stated he's never been upstairs. So when, when they're all downstairs, right, a fight breaks out. Chloe's downstairs at some point, and Chloe is the dog. Is, Chloe is the dog. Correct. Just want to make sure. There is a reason why. So the layout of the of that is basically you have two separate sides of the basement with a bathroom in the middle, and they're claiming that oh there was a plumbing issue. That's why we did the basement floor over. So they when they ripped up all the rug because it was soaked in blood, three pints of blood actually because that's how much blood John, John had lost. They also ripped up all the plywood floor. They put new plywood floor down, but no rug. So when they sold that house, right, the whole basement floor is all plywood. Now, I, I have property. When a flood happens, you rip up the area that's wet, moldy. You don't rip up from wall to wall. Why would you do that? Because Nicole Albert said today they couldn't afford to live in the house. They couldn't afford to maintain the house. They had no money. So all of a sudden they had money to rip up the floor? No. You found six drops of blood outside. The gash in the back of John's head was three inches wide, and he was drinking. His blood was thin. There would have been blood all over the snow outside. It would have been way too much blood to put in solo cups. Where are the three pints of blood? I mean, John O'Keefe was in that house. Kevin Lenahan, your thoughts. Did John O'Keefe go into the basement? GPS was designed by the U.S. military to fly a cruise missile a thousand miles through, the, through an open window. Okay, it's the most accurate location data in the world. And during the time when the defense alleges that John was up and was climbing up and down three flights of stairs, exactly during that time, they were driving to the house. That's what GPS shows. GPS shows that at least his phone never went inside the house, never even went towards the driveway. It went, the phone was found and the GPS shows r roughly where Karen parked at the edge of the property. So the idea of John going in the house becomes a stretch. It means he had to have dropped his phone and gone in there. As far as all this information about what happened on the in the basement floor, I don't know where Nick gets that from. Maybe he has a source that I don't know about because it's not anything that's revealed in the records. Joseph uh, Krauske, your thoughts about John O'Keefe entering that home that night. So look, I, I appreciate what Nick does. I've spent my career, uh, I've argued third party culprit evidence. I've argued that police have poached or coerced witnesses. I've argued police have planted uh, evidence. But in this case, what is the genesis of all of these theories? At some point you have to have percipient witnesses in evidence. Just like too many of the theories to date this seems to be made up of whole cloth without any evidence whatsoever. If John O'Keefe went in that house, why did it take Karen Reed a year to make that allegation? Why did she go to Stoughton District Court and her lawyers say if she hit him, it was an accident? If she had seen him go in that house, don't you think when she showed up at that scene at six in the morning, she would have been demanding an explanation for what happened? And as far as the staircase, look, it's one of those interesting things. And no disrespect to Nick, again, but I think the followings just become way too obsequious. No one wants to question anything. I know from dealing with forensics, you cannot completely, solely, exclusively rely on data, including Apple. I mean, this could be a ba battle of the titans between Google and GPS and Apple, but until we hear the experts, I don't believe they're going to be able to establish that he climbed uh, three flights of stairs in that house. And the theory about the basement, where is the evidence? Where's the witness? That floor wasn't torn up, my understanding was, for um, several months after that, and it was part of an insurance claim. Just like trying to sell the house, Nicole Albert was able to answer without delay. We contacted, it's what's called the first, uh, excuse me, a prior consistent statement, we contacted the realtor before anything happened on that front yard. And by the way, if I lived there and people were driving by and it become a tourist attraction and people were gawking at me and name calling my family, I would probably move my family out of that house too. But, but this story didn't get 
didn't start getting a lot of coverage until until Turtle Boy started reporting it in April, and they moved. So nobody was driving by that house at that point. They were left alone for a very long time. And there is a reason why Michael Proctor only got geofence data for Google phones. Not a lot of people have Google phones. Majority of those people in, those, in that house had Apple phones. Why didn't he get the Apple geofence data? Because it would put John in the house. Because Michael Proctor is covering up for everybody in that house. It's a fact. So I... Is so I, I think piece, something really interesting. Of... Uh, let me go. I'll go quick, Kevin. Uh, I'm going to go with Kevin first. Go ahead, Kevin. Just as a really quick piece of data he had. So they were, they know exactly where John was when he entered into his phone, 34 Fairview. And it was a little over a mile away because John had never been to the house before. And as uh, Vinny said, driving there, it's about a five minute drive to get from the waterfall there. And from that spot where he entered in, uh, uh, into the ways of 34 it, it took them four minutes to get there they actually shot past the street and had to turn around that is exactly during the time when rich green the data expert for the defense says john was inside the house and going up and downstairs it's just not even possible according to two separate reliable sets of data all right we are out of time for tonight we're out of time for this week but monday's a big day cross-examination of brian albert I'm going to make sure, I'm going to send out subpoenas over the weekend, make sure all three of you uh, come back on Monday. But thanks so much, guys. Have a great weekend.